Okay, here is the next video lecture on our unit on learning. Uh, we've covered classical conditioning and we've covered instrumental or operant conditioning. Now we're moving to the third of the four types of learning that we'll talk about. Uh, that was the last slide probably that you saw, or the last little bit of what you saw with the previous PowerPoint, so just to kind of let you know that we're right here. Now, cognitive learning represents a departure with both classical and instrumental conditioning we're looking at this sort of stimulus response kind of activity. Um, now we're moving away, or rather we're moving toward the area of the idea that we can learn actually just by thinking about things. We can think our way through problems. Uh, cognitive means thinking. So learning that occurs through the process of, of thinking. So what does that mean? Well, well, we'll talk about some of the different facets of cognitive learning. Um, the idea of latent learning, you want to have all this in your notes here too, by the way. Uh, learning can be achieved without rewards or punishments. So, so far we've talked about, you know, essentially like with classical conditioning, there's a reward set up. There is instinctive learning, but there's a desired outcome that is reinforced. Um, and with operant and, and instrumental conditioning, there are punishments and reinforcements set up. It almost takes the idea of thinking about things out of the equation up till now. Think about a time where you've learned something, not by being punished or reinforced, not e instinctively even, but just by thinking your way through. Um, I can think of examinations I took as a student, math tests. You kind of look at an equation or you look at a problem and you just kind of think about it. You're like, hmm, what should I do? What could I do? How would this work? And you may actually come upon the answer. Um, I've done that around my house. Um, I just bought a house a few years ago and I've had to diagnose assess and try to fix different problems. Problems I've never seen before. Um, I don't know how to do it. I wasn't instinctively programmed to figure it out. I wasn't punished or reinforced in the past for fixing or not fixing problems around my house. I've just had to look at things and figure it out. I've had problems with my plumbing. I've had problems with my air conditioning. You kind of look at things and you try to figure things out. Um, so, let me give you an example of latent learning. Uh, we have the cognitive psychologists who are come on, coming along and saying it's not all about punishment and reinforcement or instinct. Uh, Wolfgang Kohler said that people and animals as well learn sometimes in what's called an umweg. That's a German word that literally, literally translates to roundabout. We learn in a roundabout way by kind of thinking about things. He set up a situation where he had a chimp. You see the picture of the chimp. Uh, in a in a cage, sort of closed in, sort of kind of. I'm going to try to sketch this out for you as I talk about it. And he's going to put the chimp in a novel situation or a brand new situation, one that he's never been in before. Okay? So I'm trying to draw this as we go. Now, I'm going to label this out. The chimp is placed in a fence with a small opening. Let's see if I can get you to be able to see that. There we go. Now, the chimp now has the job of getting the banana. Now, what he saw happening was the chimp initially tried to go through the fence, and he couldn't do it. He tried to go over top of it, was not able to do that. Finally, the chimp, looking at this banana from the fence, from inside the fence, figured it out. He's like, wait a minute, I could just sneak right out here through this opening, tr travel up here, grab the banana. And that's exactly what happened. So, the chimp wasn't reinforced, he wasn't punished, there was no instinct involved, he just figured out, holy crap, there's a hole here in the fence, I can crawl through this opening and get it. Um, another example of learning without punishment or reinforcement, or not involving instinct, involves Edwin Tolman's idea of cognitive maps, and I'm going to give you an example of this. Um, we all are able to do this. Think about your house, where you live. If I turned all the lights out and had it completely pitch dark and I placed you blindfolded on your front porch and I told you, okay, you're on your front porch, you can't see, find your way to your bedroom, could you do it? And the answer is probably, yeah, you could. Because inside of your mind, you have a mental representation. A cognitive map is simply a mental representation of physical space. Write that down. Okay? A cognitive map, again, is a it's a mental representation of physical space. On your front porch, you have an image in your mind of where all the rooms in your house are. Blindfolded, you could probably, I'm going to guess, easily find your way to your bedroom without many problems. Now, there's a specific path that you took to get from your porch 
to your bedroom. Now, now I'm going to place you in your uh, in your kitchen. Okay, I'm going to say the same thing. It's blindfolded. It's dark. You can't see. You're in your kitchen. Now find your way to your bedroom again. Would you take the same steps, the same path to get to your bedroom that you took from your porch? No. Because in your mind, you know your kitchen is a different place. It's a different physical location than your porch. But you can still get to your bedroom because you've learned how to do that. In your mind, you can think about where all the rooms in your house are. And you can get there. Okay. So these are cognitive maps. We tend to... There's an exercise that I would generally do in class where I would ask you to... Uh, to map your area, you know, where, where you live. Um, generally, I have people draw a map of Charleston. I will say, okay, you, just, you can represent it any way you want to, uh, but, you know, streets, buildings, your school, whatever, draw me a map. And generally what people will do with this cognitive mapping activity is that they'll place what's important to them or what they're familiar with in their map. And you can see this is just an example of one that a student did for me a long time ago who went to, to uh, a high school around here somewhere um, and they put their home right in the middle of their map we tend to place ourselves right in the middle of these cognitive schemes or these cognitive maps and we represent what is important to us we've learned to kind of get around to navigate our area our physical space based on what's important to us not on positive reinforcement or punishment or or you know instinct necessarily now some more stuff with cognitive learning there are four different problem-solving approaches that I want to talk to you about. Uh, the first one is called insight learning. It's almost like you have what's called an aha moment. You sit, you think about a problem, maybe you've taken a test, you're staring at the same problem for five minutes and you're like, I don't know it, maybe it'll just come to me, I don't know it. All of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, wait a minute, that's it. You have that aha moment, just like, let me get back, the chimp had with the banana in the fence. Remember the uh, the diagram that I just drew you? It's almost like he's sitting there thinking, how do I get this daggone banana? Oh, wait a minute. I can go right through here and get it. It's almost like thinking your way through that problem, you come up with this moment that's like, yes, aha. Now, the second problem-solving approach is called sub-goal analysis. Now, by definition, and you'll want to jot this down too, sub-goal analysis involves taking a large task or a big a big job and breaking it down into smaller tasks or smaller goals. Okay, again, taking a big job or a big task and breaking it down into smaller tasks or smaller goals. Um, I would ask the question if we were in class, how many of you have ever had to do a research paper? There you go. It can seem like an insurmountable uh, job. When I was a student, I became very skilled at waiting till the last minute to do everything. I could stay up the night before and do most, most of my very large assignments in high school. Except Finally, and even in college, I pulled that off. I'm not recommending you try that. Finally, I got to graduate school and realized I couldn't do that. I had to write a master's thesis, which was like 20-some pages long, tons of research, and I thought, I can do this a couple nights before I got this, right? No, didn't work. So, figured out. And this is what we do with big jobs. Let's say you have a research paper that's 25 pages, okay? Are you going to wait till the night before to do your research paper? that's going to be 25 pages. You could, but you're probably not going to succeed. What you can do is if you know you have a month to do it, you could break it down into many goals, okay, or smaller goals. For example, week one, you might make it your goal just to look at research. You go online, look at research, read journals. So that that's a reasonable goal. You just kind of get acquainted. Week one, just start looking at stuff, okay? Week two, my goal, let's just say, is going to be... Um, to start my to start my rough draft, okay. Um, not my final draft, but just actually start writing something. So there you go. Week two, that's my goal. If I meet that goal, great. Week three, my goal is going to be to have finished my rough draft, have it completely done, okay. That way, I can take it to the teacher or the professor, have him or her look at it, get feedback. So week three, there it is. Finish my rough draft. And then by week four, my goal will be to have everything done. Final draft complete. Done. There you see it. Week four, final draft done. That way, I've taken a big job and I've broken it down into many tasks. You can do it with a home improvement project. You can do it with, you know, a lot of you guys have like senior, you know, I think they're called what, portfolios where you have to put a bunch of stuff together. You know, you might break that down. 
into smaller goals. Algorithms, the third problem solving approach that we'll discuss here. By definition, an algorithm involves using a specific mathematical formula to solve a problem. So you're using, again, specific mathematical formulas to solve problems. E equals mc squared is an example of that. Uh, the quadratic equation, as you can see on here, these represent algorithms, specific formulas used to arrive at a specific answer. Then we get into the things that are probably a little more fun to talk about, heuristics. Uh, heuristics are essentially mental shortcuts or rules of thumb that we use to make decisions. And I'll explain what I mean by that here just in a second a little more. Again, heuristics by definition are rules of thumb or mental shortcuts that we take to arrive at solutions to problems. So you have the four major problem solving approaches here that we've, um, that we've talked about. And we're going to now talk about three types of heuristics. There are three, again, we just defined what a heuristic is generally. Now there are three types of heuristics. We have the representative heuristic, we have the availability heuristic, and the adjustment heuristic. And you'll want to write all three down and understand what they mean. I'm going to start with the representative heuristic. The representative heuristic is simply stereotyping. It's the same thing as stereotyping. Definition of the representative heuristic. We tend to make decisions about people based on characteristics that they have that we assume to be true about all people from their category. For example, it's easier for me to assume things about you based on your appearance than it would be for me to get to know you. And I'll give you a good example. I've talked about this before. Um, I travel to the northeastern part of this country and someone meets me from Massachusetts. They meet me for the first time. They look at the way I'm dressed. They listen to the way that I talk. I tell them I'm, I tell them I'm from West Virginia. Instead of taking the time to get to know me, they just assume that I'm a dumb redneck hillbilly without any education and probably missing half my teeth and they ask me if I've done meth. I'm thinking, that's really nice. Appreciate that a lot. Uh, had they taken the time to get to know me, they may have discovered that I do have all my teeth. I have never done meth. I do have friends who have done it, but that's another story for another day. And I have four degrees. Uh, not, not that that makes me smart, but it's just, you know, you, you get to know someone a little better. It takes time. You start to dispel some of those stereotypes. That's the representative heuristic. Um, I love this image up here. We look up here, you got, you've got uh, an African-American, it might even be Snoop Dogg, and Martha Stewart. And you ask the question, which one of these people has a felony? Most people would say, well, it's the black guy. It's got to be, right? Because we stereotype people. Actually, it's Martha Stewart <laughs> um, who has been convicted of a felony. Um, you have, I'm going to kind of, I'll come back to that slide. So what is a stereotype? The representative heuristic is the same thing as a stereotype. And here's your definition of a stereotype. It's a cognitive framework suggesting that all members of social groups share certain characteristics. All black people like fried chicken and Kool-Aid, which is obviously a stereotype. I like fried chicken and Kool-Aid, quite frankly. I, I could eat that every day. Uh, we assume that black people are criminals, that they like rap music. We assume that white people from, from your area, I'm from Lincoln County, so people assume things about us as, as, as white people. Uh, that we're rednecks, that we're uneducated, that we hunt, that we fish, that we're ignorant. So again, the problem with stereotypes is that they're often not true. Uh, we look at these images and I would ask you, what would you assume to be true about these people? If I ask you about the guy on the left, if we were in class, I would ask you, what, what kind of job does he have? What kind of music does he listen to? How does he treat women? I get a lot of the same answers. Well, he's, he listens to country music. He's not very good to women. He's uneducated. He's probably unemployed, and if he does have a job, it's probably like a blue-collar job. Then we ask about the guy here on the right. You know, what kind of job does he have? How smart is he? How is he with girls? And you get the same kind of answers. Well, he's really, really smart. He has no social skills whatsoever. He's probably really awkward with girls. And that may or may not be true. What kind of music does he listen to? Probably not country music. Probably something else. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, stereotyping the girl here, the girls on the left. Uh, some of you in my classes are cheerleaders. Do we still have the stereotype of the cheerleader being, you know, ditzy and loose with her morals and peppy and all these other things? Uh, not really intelligent. Well, obviously those things are not always true. Again, we stereotype uh, stereotype African Americans in ways that we just talked about. They're all thugs. They're rap. They listen to rap music, in and out of prison. 
You know, they've got eight kids with eight different mothers. This is what we assume to be true about the black man. Again, unfortunate stereotypes. It's easier just to make those assumptions about people as opposed to really taking time to get to know them. Uh, we assume that jocks, the idea of the jock is these guys are not real bright. They have the smart guys doing their homework for them. They're, they don't treat women very well. They, they're they arrogant, blah, blah, blah. And that, again, may or may not be true. There are more exceptions to these stereotypes than actual people who fit the definitions. So we can stereotype people based on a lot of different uh, ways in a lot of different areas. Okay. And we'll go ahead and call that the end of this part. The last part will be very, very short. So we'll call that the end of this part. Thank you.